Guys, um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, great. Welcome back. Um, so today we are going to start a very interesting topic. Um, so this is ITS 350. Okay. Um, and as you know, we were talking about cryptography uh, last week. I was motivating the topics. You have a lab this Thursday. Uh, make sure you have your VM. Uh, you're going to need the seed VM for this. So make sure you download it. I, again, I think I, I said this before. I posted the instructions on, on the course website. I'm downloading the VM and through VMware, uh, creating a virtual machine. So you should see that there. Okay, uh, I just kind of started uh, laying out the lab. Last week, we're doing symmetric key encryption, secret key. And I started to talk about block ciphers and all of those little details. Um, today, I'm going to get, we're going to start really getting into uh, deeper uh, ideas. Okay, and so we're going we're gonna to start our, our discussion of this. Should be pretty interesting. Uh, I will write it, I'll, I will write a lot of this uh, on the whiteboard. Um, some of this is in the slides. Uh, you know, a lot of it is in the slides. A lot of it is in the book, the computer and internet security, those, those cryptography chapters. And some of these notes I'm taking from uh, Dan Bonet book uh, where he presents, um, you know, cryptography as well. So I, I have my notes, kind of a mix of a lot of things, but you should be able to read it there uh, in those books in different ways. Uh, also, um, you know, just you can take notes or you have this video, I guess. We, are, we should be recording. Okay. So before I, I get started today, um, are there any questions? I don't think so. All right, great. Well, and then all right, all right. We're on Thursday, we're just going to uh, work on the lab, okay? So, you know, we're going to work on that secret. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to the whiteboard. Excuse me, Professor Kellogg, can I ask yes. just one question? Uh -huh. uh, I know that last week we spoke a little bit about mm -hmm. um, non repudiation. I was just wondering if you could kind of briefly mention what the difference would be between confidentiality and non-repudiation. Right, that's a good question. So non-repudiation is that you can't deny that you did something. So, so you want to have algorithms that, you know, given some situation, you know, the sender cannot deny that it came from that sender. It's a type of authentication. So I sent, a message, right? Um, something, a signal. And then it's a bad, it's, it's like an attack, you know, it's something that causes harm, for instance. So then, you know, the FBI or someone who wants to investigate you, this sender would say, no, it wasn't me. You know what I mean? Prove it. Prove, FBI, go ahead and prove that it was me rather, right? And so that's what non-repudiation is, that if you build a system really well, right, like a banking system or a message board system, Facebook, you know, that kind of thing, they cannot deny that they are the ones that did it. That's what, that's what non-repudiation means. And it's how, how, so that's the why. Now, how is it accomplished? That's going to be accomplished through some kind of authentication, and we're going. To, and that's something you haven't we haven't talked about yet. Uh, that we can use uh, asymmetric encryption, uh, asymmetric for um, authentication as well. So the sender cannot deny that that he was able to send things. Does that make sense? 
Yes, that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Yeah, that, that's the basic idea. Um, and that's non-repudiation. You asked about confidentiality. Confidentiality is different. Confidentiality is that this person sends the message and some person, Zelda, in the middle, can't read the message. That's confidentiality. And that's, so that would be symmetric key encryption or, or some other, it could be asymmetric too, but usually symmetric or block cipher. They can't read it. Here, they can't deny that it was them. Make sense? That make, yes, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay, great, excellent. All right, uh, so that's a good question. All right, so you guys can see the whiteboard? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so as I was saying, so today we're gonna go over uh, intro to cryptography. So really we're gonna look at the primitives of this, um, you know, the basic, it's like, like saying we're gonna, we're gonna go and look at the basic building blocks of how do you create complex cryptographic systems. Our goal eventually will be SSL, right? Uh, that's kind of like the most complex one we have, but that takes a lot of building blocks. And it's like, you know, we're gonna put a block and then another block and another block and then a block on top of that, right? And a block on top of that and then a block over here and so on, right? So we're gonna, and then, you know, so it doesn't go down the block. So we're gonna, we're gonna build on a lot of blocks to get to SSL. And so that, in SSL, because SSL achieves a lot of things. It'll achieve authentication, it'll, it'll achieve confidentiality, integrity, many things, non-repudiation. And so all of these primitives we need to accomplish. And so we need to learn the crypto primitives, okay? So that's you know, the very first thing is we're gonna start building our systems And it's called a crypto primitives, okay? And so we are going to use um, that, the labs also, you know, we're gonna look at some labs, some coding labs and some labs that are just practical on the, on the Linux terminal. And so, you know, that should help us quite a bit. So as you know, you know, I don't have to convince you of cryptography's importance, right? It's probably, you know, it's, it's essential to everything we do. It's essential to our Zoom online education right now. Uh, it's essential to everything, right? Um, it's essential. We have HTTPS, we have wireless, uh, we have encryption of files, right? Um, you, know, you know, people protect their uh, multimedia, their, your DVDs, the movie industry, everything uh, thanks to cryptography. Okay, so we need to establish some parameters. So usually um, we're talking about communication. So that's the very first thing that, you know, we kind of need to identify is that this is, you know, at the end of the day, communication. Okay, between point A and point B, we're sending a signal information, okay? So uh, a lot, of, so let's go over here. So let's basically then define that what we want is secure communication. We want secure communication. So for instance, you know, the classic example of the client server ar architecture. Right? So we have a laptop. And then we have a server over here, right? So that's client, you know, this is server. Let's say this is a web, oops. So forgetting that this is different. Okay, so this is, you know, some kind of a web server, let's say, okay? And we have usually two parties, Alice, and Bob. So a lot of the pro examples that I'm, we're going to look at in the class 
this um, semester will involve Bob and Alice. All right, and uh, we're going to then establish a secure communication and we're gonna do that through SSL and then the protocol that has been established for that, which is TLS, the transport layer. Transport layer security is called, so TLS. Transport layer security. And the name comes, so SSL is kind of like a framework, I would, I would almost define it. It's not so much the specific algorithm because you can change algorithms like boxes. You can put this algorithm or that, but the idea is that the primitives. So there's a difference between a primitive and an algorithm, okay? The primitive would be like, okay, this is symmetric block cipher. And then which algorithm we use, you know, DES, triple DES, AES, whatever, you know, that, that's a different thing. So SSL is that, SSL is, is a framework built on the ideas of the primitives and a whole bunch of algorithms. TLS, this one over here, is a protocol, if you will. And the name really comes from the OSI model. So if you remember your OSI, right, you have like the ethernet layer, and then you have what, the IP, and then you have the TCP, let's say, and then the application layer somewhere in there. And TLS just kind of squeezes in there sometimes. You know, so it's really like that way of thinking about it. There's in C, you have libraries for TLS that allow you to build applications. Uh, and it, it but, but it's basically implementing SSL principles. That's what I want you to understand. So really, S I will be referring a lot just to SSL. Uh, in this in this course, not so much TLS, which is more of might have variants, but the ideas are pretty much the same. And I should define SSL as the secure sockets layer. Excuse me, Professor Kellogg. Go ahead. Does um, SSL, does it utilize um, AES encryption or do I have that wrong? It, you're, you're right, no, you're right. So what we're gonna learn, and, and so, you're, so usually I don't like to define SSL right now. What I usually tell students is this, I'm going to mention SSL today, and then six weeks from now, I'm going to properly define it. Why six weeks from now? Because first, you need to understand that it involves RSA, AES, or DES, and those are symmetric and asymmetric encryption, and it achieves confidentiality, integrity, authentication, and then symmetric encryption is block ciphers and so on. Do you see how I, what I'm saying is going back to that idea of the blocks? You see that one? So you mentioned AES, right? Right. What are your blocks right there? Make so, sense? Yes, yeah, so SSL use diff uses different methods of encryption, correct? It uses different methods of encryption to achieve different goals. So there's, you know, RSA or, oops, sorry. RSA, which is asymmetric. AES, which is symmetric. And combination integrity, hash functions. All of these principles work together to achieve specific goals. Yes. You understand? That makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So, so as I was saying though, for you to really understand all of this, you know, we really want to spend some time on each one. So we are starting with not a yes, which is the algorithm, but just symmetric block cipher encryption techniques. You see, that's what a yes is just an algorithm that implements in a complex way, symmetric block cipher encryptions. You see that? Yes, I do. Yeah, and so that's what we're going to be defining and that is the primitives. So that's the primitives that we're, and, and, and we're gonna understand why, because the problem is you can't build SSL just on AES. It's impossible. It just would not work. You see that? 
And you also cannot build SSL just on RSA. It, the, the word, you know, it wouldn't function properly either. And you can't just build it on hash. But if you combine all of these things, you build this framework as extremely powerful and that amazingly makes our entire world possible. Our entire digital world is possible thanks to all of these things. Good question. Are there any other questions? Thanks. I don't think so. Seems pretty straightforward so far. All right, great. All right, so so we're go we're headed in that direction. Okay. So I so you'll hear me say it, you know, at some point later, uh, it'll just take me, you know, less than 30 minutes to define secure sockets uh, a few weeks from now but you will understand what I mean by every little aspect of it. Okay, um, so we're gonna use SSL uh, framework. It's not an algorithm, it's a, it's a framework of primitives and algorithms. Um, and, but ultimately, we're going to use it to achieve the goal of having secure communication. That's really what we care about at this time. Okay, so the goals are, so some of the, you know, our goals are, as we were discussing initially, we want, you know, imagine always we're sending a message, right? Some kind, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, for the, what's so great about computers is at the end of the day, whether we're sending it through uh, radio waves, we're sending it through the cable line as electricity, or we're sending it through fiber optic as light at the end of the day is digital, right? So it's digital. And so it's, it's basically, uh, you know, a stream of bits. So it's, you know, binary. Okay. So that message that we're sending as binary, a sequence of zeros and ones, we want to ensure that meets certain goals. The goals are, no eavesdropping, okay, and no tampering, at least, but there's more. So no eavesdropping, which pillar is that? Confidentiality. Confidentiality, exactly, very good. And what about no tampering? Integrity. Integrity, right? Okay. So that's, uh, those are the goals that we are trying to achieve. <laughs> okay, so let's think about uh, SSL for a second here. Even though we're not gonna define it, um, we're gonna lay, uh, lay the foundation for it. So SSL, we can say, is the framework. It's the framework um, to secure, for instance, web traffic. Okay, so again, going back to the classic example, you want to go, you want to buy some things on Amazon, you want to go to your bank. Every time you do that, you're using SSL. There are two main parts, so that, that I'm going to lay the foundation for that. There are two main parts of SSL. There's what you could call the handshake protocol, not to be confused with the three-way handshake in TCP communication. This is a little bit different although similar idea, that's why it's called the handshake protocol. Okay, um, and there's the, so let's, let's say this would be established a shared secret. A shared all right, and then we have 
The other uh, part of SSL, the other main part, which is uh, transmit the data. Okay, so let's say uh, send data. Okay, and you want to send the data securely or with the, using the shared secret. Using the shared secret. Okay, so that's the main, the main ideas. First, we need to establish a shared secret. And, and maybe right now that's not so obvious, but it will become obvious later. Okay, and then once you've, do, once you've done that, send the data using the shared secret and achieve, again, your, your objectives of, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and so on. So now, now that I've said all of this, how does this, what, how do you translate this into like a diagram? So the way to translate that is, let's say I have Alice and Bob, right? And they have their respective computing devices. There's a communication channel. And what is the shared secret? Let's just call it K. That shared secret basically usually is referred to as the key. Okay, there's some kind of a key associated and you have to establish that secret key. Imagine that Alice is in North America, Bob is in Europe, right? They want to send communication through the unsecure internet. Well, for it to be secure, they're gonna need a combination of an algorithm, right? Which is an encryption algorithm, a decryption algorithm, which is known by everyone, and a shared secret, which is the key, okay? And given that key, they can now use these two algorithms to convert the data into what's called a cipher, right? So the cipher then is what gets sent. But the cipher, remember, is not the, the, the original message, it is the scrambled message. So it is the message that now looks like gibberish and, you know, and all of that, for instance. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay. So now even more formally, let's define a symmetric or symmetric encryption. So we're going to define symmetric encryption. And remember that at the end of the day, encryption is nothing more than software. Okay. I mean, it's, it's software, it's code, right? You're going to write some code. That's why we're going to do some Python examples. Just, you know, Python is a lot easier than looking at the SSL code. Um, and it's just basically for understanding. We're going to start with a very basic, uh, you know, cipher type, uh, like the like like ciphers before uh, Second World War, which were uh, ciphers that were just you know what are called substitution or or things like that ciphers. And then you know the more modern ciphers that um, are be, are still in use today. All right, so we're defining now symmetric encryption. We, we kind of looked at it, you know, kind of informally over here, you know, and now we're just gonna make it a little bit more formal by defining several things. So I'm going to define that there is now E, which is the encryption algorithm. Okay, so this is going to be our encryption algorithm. Okay. Then uh, again, we have Alice and Bob, and they just need to communicate securely. So it, we're going to assume here that the communication is going to take place in that direction. Okay, uh, although you know it can be in any direction, but just for the way I'm writing this. Then I have the decryption algorithm over here. So I'm going to have an input, which I'm going to call usually M, and that just stands for plain text. Plain text. So this is in its simplest form, as you will do it on the CBM, is nothing more than um, 
you know, a text file. Create a little text file, you write on it. Like I said, I, I like to do uh, a test, um, and I'm sure we can do it virtually, where I, I, you have to get an A in that test, you have to decrypt something. So I'm gonna give you a problem, some code and things like that, and on your report, you have to actually um, tell me the message that I wrote in there. If you don't tell me the message, you know, you don't make it. So you have to understand everything that I'm doing to encrypt that. And I'm not doing anything complicated. It's just using these primitives. I kind of, you know, it's like playing a little game, if you will. All right. So uh, once I have the message, the message is the plain text. What I want to do is I want to encrypt it, right? And I want to create the cipher, which usually is referred to by the letter C. And the cipher is basically an algorithm E, the encryption algorithm, which takes as input K, right, comma, M. And the output of that is C, right? So that's the output of it. So let me erase that. All right, so this K, of course, is that shared secret that I was talking about. You have to have it. No, without, without K, you can't do anything. On the other end, on Bob's side, uh, Bob also has a decryption algorithm. And if you will notice, Bob wants to get the original message M, right? So to do that, Bob will use a decryption algorithm given K and the cipher. And that algorithm will return M the original message, okay? And so that basically means that Bob also needs to have the, the K. So in symmetric encryption, if Alice is in North America and Bob is in Europe, and they need to establish a communication, you know, they're, they're, they're spies or something, right? So they need to send, you know, spy information via the internet, What's the problem with this scenario? What's the problem with it? If you, if you, if you somehow there's, there's spies, but you know, they have to get to different, different locations. One another. What's the problem with this scenario that you can see? They have to get the key to one another. They have to get the key to one another. Exactly. Um, so how, how do they exchange that key? What would you guys recommend? They're spies, right? So what, what would they, what would you recommend? What do you think? Just intuitively, what would you do? Have like a face-to-face -face exchange of a USB or something? Face-to-face, -face, right? So that's what we think of right now. And before all of this, right, before, you know, let's talk about like the, probably the Second World War, the Enigma machines and all of that people needed to have these little books, right? So I think what they did is they had a book uh, and the book, uh, the key changed every day. So they had like a calendar and they would say, okay, today is this date. And so, and so they would look, oh, the key for today is this. With that key, they were able to break uh, their algorithms, right? Because they had some kind of a encryption technique. It's very good. Um, so that's one of the challenges. How do we, How do we exchange the key? Right, that, that secret key, how do we do that? So that's one of the primitives that we will talk about. So remember, um, oops. here, right, one of the primitives of this is we have to figure out how to exchange that secret key to achieve certain goals, security goals. And so that will be part of our, um, part of the primitives that we need to learn. Okay, now the secret key here, what is the secret key? The secret key is nothing more because at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, digits, right? It's gonna be a binary, zeros and ones, a whole bunch of zeros and ones it really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, it, 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 should just, it should just meet 
two conditions. Okay, and then we'll show why, but really just two main conditions. One of them is the size of it. All right, you want it to be as big as possible, but obviously you can't have a, a, a key that is as big as the universe, right? That, uh, that would not work, or even le a lot less than that, because it, the computer would not be efficient. Imagine a movie, you know, um, it would be very inefficient to do a lot of operations with, with things that consume a lot of memory. So it needs to be, um, it needs to be of a specific size, usually, you know, you will see, you know, um, measurements, 128 bits, for instance, you know, that, that that's how keys are measured. You'll see, oh, it's a 256, you know, byte or, or bits or, or something. The other condition is that it must be random. Now, can you achieve 100% randomness on a computer? No. No, right? You cannot. And that presents a problem because computers are deterministic, pseudo-random. So even an algorithm that you think is really good, it's only pseudo-random, right? So, but to achieve perfect, perfectness in security, you need perfect randomness or, or that's your goal anyway, nobody achieves it. So you so really the, in, in, a, in a sense, if you measure the, the security systems, you're, you're almost saying that they're not 100% secure, but they're good enough. That's kind of the intuition that you probably want to want to get there. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. All right. So now there's a few other things that are important. I talked about E and D, right? The encryption and the decryption algorithm. Those are the encryption algorithms, okay? And you might, I don't know, this might surprise you, maybe not, but the, the algorithms are not obfuscated. It's not like you hide them. It's not like every company has a different one. In fact, the encryption algorithms, the encryption algorithms, are publicly known. Okay, are publicly known. I mean, and when, 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 when it is said that they are publicly known, it means that they are really well known. Uh, you know, AES and DES are some of the most well-studied algorithms in the history of computing. They, you know, they've been studied extensively. To, to try to understand because people, the goal of people is to try to break them. Imagine if somebody was able to break SSL right now, nothing would work. The day that somebody um, breaks all of those, finds a way, easy way to break them, you know, the, our whole digital society would, would, would end, right? Because you wouldn't be able to do a secure transaction, people would steal your money. You wouldn't be able to send emails. People would read your messages. You wouldn't be able to go to Netflix. People would steal your movies, you know? So your Amazon, you wouldn't be able to shop online because everyone would be, you know, stealing your, your, your information. And so, so really uh, the algorithms have to be studied really well and they are. So in fact, whenever you use something, you use something that is really well studied. For instance, you know, we'll be using OpenSSL in Linux, which has everything. You know, OpenSSL will have literally all the primitives, and that's really what the labs are about. And so, um, you will, they're well known. There's, there's no, nothing to hide. What, what you must, though, keep secret is your key. keep as a secret. So, you know, I've already said this, but so E is the encryption algorithm. So e is the encryption algorithm and D is the decryption algorithm. Right, decryption algorithm. And the only secret is this one. Okay, that's the only secret. The key or K. Any questions so far, guys? 
Uh, not yet, I don't think. No. Okay. All right, so, so. Okay, so now let's move on then. So then, you know, kind of in summary, the core of the core, the core uh, of cryptography the core of cryptography is two things one is the secret key the stout what is called the secret key establishment Secret key establishment, right? And then secure communication with the established key. Secure communication with the established key. Okay, so that's the basic. Uh, core of cryptography. So now that we've talked about that, let's go ahead and define uh, symmetric ciphers. Okay, so our, you know, our, uh, I usually don't. You know, some people in their in the in books, uh, even in the, in the Seed Labs book, uh, they'll start with like uh, substitution ciphers and then build on that. I think you know, I'm just going to start with symmetric ciphers. But in one of the labs. There is a problem where I'm going to ask you to do a substitution cipher and you'll just write the code. We'll discuss it in the class. It should be really fun uh, to figure out. Um, and you'll see, you know, my goal with that problem is to show you that even though it's highly insecure, that's, you know, that's not secure at all, but it is actually pretty, um, pretty difficult to code. So that's really the the goal. All right, so symmetric ciphers. So I, I really like cryptography, it's so much fun. All right, so symmetric ciphers here. Okay, so let's start with a definition. So remember, I, I've kind of said they're symmetric and asymmetric. They're symmetric and asymmetric um, encryptions, right? So this is the, the definition of it. Definition. Uh, so a cipher, that's the first thing you'll, you'll, you'll hear, he'll hear me refer to that a lot. Um, and so we need to provide a formal definition of that. So a cipher is defined, is defined as a pair, as a pair of efficient, of efficient algorithms. Algorithms, and they are E for encryption and D for decryption. Okay, so there's usually two of them, but they work together in some way. There's actually one operation. I think I already talked about it. What was that operation? XOR operation. All right. okay. No, we'll do an example of XOR today. And XOR because computers are really good at XORing, right? Because it's bits. So you take, uh, you know, a, a transistor sequence of bits, right? And then another set of bits, and you can just perform uh, an XOR operation and you're done. You flip that bit to something else. And so um, they're really fast at it. And so it makes sense to build cryptographic systems around very efficient uh, operations. You don't want to you know, have some very complex operation that would take forever and then it would be unfeasible to use it. All right, so now that I've done this, uh, so a cipher is defined as a pair of efficient algorithms, E and D, where, where E, K, M gives you the cipher, okay? And D, same K, but now that cipher 
gives you back the original plain text message given the consistency equation, which is really simple. The consistency equation. And that's just going to be D K, right? Now, in, in the place of, um, in, instead of C, we're just going to have, well, C is equal to EKM, right? So it's just going to be EKM, close the other parentheses, equal M. So that's the consistency equation because we know that we take the original message with the key, we encrypt it, that gives us the cipher. And then the cipher with the key and the decryption algorithm gives us back the message. Okay, so that's really our definition. Oh, I forgot to put it. That's our definition of what we're doing. So really, some symmetric ciphers are, a cipher is defined as a pair of efficient algorithms where EKM gives a cipher and DKC gives us the message given the consistency equation, which looks like that one. Any questions so far? Okay. Okay, no questions. So, uh, Okay, sometimes these algorithms in the encryption, for instance, we talked about the initialization vector, the IV, right? Uh, and so they will have maybe an additional uh, parameter, right? Which is the initialization vector. And it's really just like another key, not a, not a key that you have to keep so secure anymore, but just a key that uh, provides a little bit more randomization, okay? A little bit more randomization. We talked about this last week. Okay. So now let's introduce um, let's introduce the operation. So let me let's introduce the operation first. So I've been talking about how uh, we do XOR, right? XOR. And we're just gonna do a little exercise here. Okay. So let's talk about, oops, the XOR operation. So I'm sure you learned this when you took uh, in, in, in one of your classes, uh, you learned about the truth tables. And so we're, we're, that's really what I'm going to look at. So the rule with, with an XOR operation is you're going to have a, a sequence of bits, right? And then you apply another sequence of bits. You're going to perform the XOR operation. And so the question is, what do you get here, right? What is the, the result? So based on the type of operation you're applying and or and so on, you should get a specific value. So in the case of XOR, it's like they, it has a rule. So XOR basically is um, one or the other, but not both. So that's how you can remember it. One or the other or not both. Another way that you can remember this is just by looking at the truth table. Truth table. All right. And that's just going to be, you know, let's say I have zero, 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 one, one, zero, excuse me, and one, one. So I'm going to perform an XOR operation here. And my result should be according to that one or the other, but not both. Okay. So that means it's going to be one, right? here and here it's going to be one 
But here we have both, and here we have both, right? So zero and zero. So that's the result of the XOR operation. That's what you always do. So that, you know, if it's, if it's both the same, it's zero. Otherwise, it's uh, one. Okay, and so that's, you know, our truth table for the XOR operations. So now, whenever, now you won't really have to do this by hand, to be honest. I mean, we're just going to use uh, Python functions. Python has a, a way of doing XOR operation a very easily. Okay. So let's do an example to kind of drive this a little bit more. I'm going to do an example here, and I'm just going to say, so I'm now going to put it in the context of cryptography. So I'm going to say, you know, I have a plain text uh, message. I have a key, and then I'm going to have the cipher. So I'm, I want to do that operation. So the plain text is going to be 10111101. Right, so that just a random sequence of bits there. Or rather, that would probably have a pattern because it's, it's your message, right? Now, the key should be a random sequence of bits as much as possible. So let's imagine it's 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Right, so that's your um, key. And then now you're going to perform the XOR operation, right? So we're going to perform the XOR operation. So we know this is a zero, this is a zero, this is a zero, one, 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 one. And this one, what's this one? One. 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 Back. That came out so crooked. I don't know why. <laughs> let me let me redo that. Sorry. So that should be one zero 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 one one one. Okay. So that basically yeah, that's correct. Okay. So that's that's it. So we performed an XOR operation uh, on those two. Okay. Make sense, guys? Yeah. Well, great. Now let's let's take a minute now. Usually um, this would have been, let's see, let's now let's do another example. Let's do another one. Let's drive it to the second example. Example. What's this? Okay, we're gonna do another example, example num number two. Uh, again, I believe this is a pretty different. Yeah, this is different. Okay, so I'm gonna take, now I'm gonna encrypt. So this, um, this is going to be encrypt. All right, so we can see here encrypt. Okay, so we have message, we have key, and we have cipher. Okay, so that's going to be the encryption process. So now I'm gonna just do it a little bit more complete. I'm gonna have zero, one, one, zero, Sometimes I do this, you might see me do that. It just means a zero when I want to distinguish it from an O. Uh, one, 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 then one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, right? And I'm going to perform the XOR operation. Okay, so again, this should give me, you know, one, one, zero, one. What about this one? 
One. One, one, and the last one? Zero. There you go. So that's the encrypt process, okay? Now, we need to do the decrypt process. So decrypt, it's going to be, uh, we define decryption, right? We have the algorithm. Uh, so at this point, we can summarize that the decryption algorithm in its simplest form. Now, this is a, uh, a decryption algorithm, but it's not the decryption algorithm of, let's say, DES or AES. That's what you need to understand is that this is really, it is in a sense a decryption or an encryption algorithm, but they're the most basic of, of encryption algorithms, okay? So usually, um, we're going to see something called a one-time pad, which basically tells us that this algorithm, the one-time pad OTP, is going, to, is going to tell us that that algorithm, which is just defined as K XOR C, could in fact be 100% secure. It could, in theory. Unfortunately, in reality, we're going to see why we cannot actually use such a simple one. And so what people do is that they have created DES and AES, which are built on top of that operation, but they just have more complexity, okay? They, they have a lot more complexity, really. It, it, it's, it's almost like saying they just perform tons of XORs and they jumble the data that way and this way. And so that's why later on, we're gonna see how DES works um, but really all they're doing is, you know, at the end of the day is an XOR operation. And we're going to see that that just that XOR operation could be enough in theory, but in practicality, it is not practical to, to use, but we'll talk about that in a second. And so therefore we need to add complexity to improve the algorithm. All right, uh, so that's the encryption uh, algorithm. The encryption algorithm is K message, right? And that's going to be K XOR message. And in its simplest form, that's what we are doing here. Okay, that's what we're doing here. So now to define the decrypt algorithm, I'm going to take the cipher the key and the message. Okay, so again, I'm gonna do 1101, 110, right? Just taking that cipher there, see that they're the same. So it's 1101, 110. We have the key already. That was one zero one one zero zero one. So the key is one zero one one zero zero one, and we perform the decryption yet again on 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 the cipher and the key to get back the message. All right, and so we apply the XOR operation. So that's zero. Right. And that's zero one one zero one one one. These two should match because it's the whole process of encrypting and decrypting. Do they match? Mm, yes, they match. And so we are correct. Is this clear, guys? Yeah. Are there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. It makes good sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me. All right. So. Now that we have defined XOR as an operation, you know, we have our encryption and our decryption, as I said, they basically just, oh, sorry. So encryption, you know, it's just gonna be key XOR message. Decryption is going to be key XOR, the cipher. So we've defined these. These are the most basic 
of encryption and decryption algorithms for symmetric key encryption. On top of these, we, we then build, you know, deaths, triple deaths. Deaths, triple deaths. Oops, sorry. Triple deaths and a yes. Okay, so we have these three um, algorithms that we build on top of XOR. They're just much more complicated, as you will see. It's like we take a block, we split it, we resize it, we split it again. I mean, just the name here kind of gives you an idea. So what do you think? So let's say, regardless of what DES is, what do you think triple DES is? Just in three, just done three times. Two or three times, exactly. And the idea being that if it took a computer to break DES in two days, okay, well, let's make triple DES. It'll take six days to break, right? You see that? And so um, that's kind of the idea. And, and it was kind of when, 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 can you guys, did you guys lose my uh, whiteboard? Yeah, it looks yeah. like it. Oh, I'm back, I'm back. Okay. There it is. Yeah, there it is. Something I thought I had deleted. All right. Um, so it's still there. Good. So uh, what was I saying? So I was saying, you know, somebody broke this. And when they broke this, I'm sure there were a lot of systems that they, they just wanted to know how to, how to solve it. And they probably just create a triple death. You know, okay, let's do, you know, because at the end of the day, remember that really what happens on the internet is that algorithms uh, only have a key for a very short period of time before they change, very, you know, even minutes. And so even if a computer has all, can break an algorithm, it doesn't matter because even if it takes an hour to break it, by the time they've broken it, there's a new key that was selected randomly or pseudo randomly. And so the process you know, goes on. So, so there's kind of that, that built in um, as well. All right, so we have, uh, we've defined this. Okay. All right, usually at this point, if we were in the classroom, I would do a pop quiz where you would write it, write the answer, but, um, you know, since you can't really send me I just don't know the practicality of this. So for now, I'm, I'm only going to do this as, as a question, and I'm going to ask for a volunteer to solve it. Give me the answer. Whoever, whoever does it first. I'm only going to give like three minutes on this. Whoever solves it first. And, and, and does the answer on the share your screen, do the whiteboard, will get bonus points. Okay, not much, but some bonus points on top of labs. Make sense? Guys, so, so we're able to use the whiteboard feature? You can share. If I stop sharing, let, let's do this. Actually, that's a good point. I'm going to stop sharing. Somebody volunteer, please. And, and share, share their, their whiteboard. whiteboard. Okay, so let's stop sharing. Share. Okay, now, now somebody, somebody try to share your whiteboard. Your whiteboard. Um, I don't know what's happening, but your audio is like you sound like a kind of like a super villain right now. It's um Yeah, it sound like Optimus Prime. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's it's a little hard to so so we're using a whiteboard feature. That was that was the idea. Idea. Uh, how? So you, 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 have you guys been able to hear me? Yeah, it, it just started with the weird rope body voice, but also I just try just for testing it. I tried doing a screen share, and it looks like it uh, it's disabled for us. Just so you're aware as well. What kit is the robotic? robotic uh, is that That's still going, going on, on or, or is it better, better now? now? Uh, it's still going for me. I don't know about anybody else. Is that for everyone, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Is it possible to reset your audio, like switch it to a Bluetooth set and then switch back? Uh, I'm not finding any options right now. What's, what's, what's the mic? Uh, what about the, the last, last time I met? Is it working fine? Yeah, up until just now, you have sounded perfectly fine to me. At least it's like just at this moment that it's uh it's going off crazy. <laughs> The only thing I can think of is let, let me let me let me pause the Is this better? Much better. Much better. Like you're back to normal now, it sounds like to me. I, 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 yeah, you're back to normal. Okay, all right. Well, let, just let me know, okay? Um, I just turned up the volume a little. Okay, so it is a little bit better now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Yeah, so just keep me informed, please. All right, so let's not do the quiz thing. Um, I'm not sure how to do it correctly in this environment. Instead, just think about it and maybe let's talk about it, right? So you can, someone, someone to get the bonus points, just, um, just say, okay? You know, say your name and that you wanna go first and then we'll, you know, I'll give you the bonus points. All right, so little quiz, short quiz, okay? Uh, a spoken quiz, only one person will get the credit, whoever goes first. Should be very easy, but you have to give me the solution, the why. Okay, so you are given, you are given uh, a message, M. Okay, we know what that is, that's the plain text message. And, and it's cipher, right? The cipher. Now the question is, obviously we're using XOR, right? XOR. So can you compute, the question is, can you compute the key? Have said cipher. So can you compute the key and you know from M and C? Can you compute the key? So I'm gonna actually make it like multiple choice uh, so that it's a little bit easier to track. It's A, B, C, D. Okay, so it's gonna be A. No, you cannot. B, 
Yes. You can. C. C is I can only compute half the key. Yes, the key is K cipher XOR cipher. So remember, don't just, if you want the credit, you have to say, my name is so and so. And so I can write it down. And then, um, Say which one of these, A, B, or C, and also how you know. You have to work, you know, tell me the solution. Make sense? So I'm gonna give you guys 20, 30 seconds or so to think about it before I give the solution. So somebody can, if you already know, just go ahead and, and say it. Is this clear, guys? Question? Yes, it's clear. Right, I'll Maybe try it. You're ready. Okay, you're ready. What's your name? Sorry. Karen. Aaron. Okay. Aaron. Karen what? with a K. Aaron, what's sorry? Karen with a K. Oh, Karen. Karen. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, what's the answer? I think the answer is yes. Which which letter is that? Letter B. B. Okay. She Karen says B. All right. Let's see what that okay. And why do you think that? Because you're given the method of encryption, which is XOR, you have yeah. the message and you have the cipher, so you should be able to figure out the key. You should be able to figure out the key, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So let's look at that logic. Let's see. Who, who thinks that, that Karen is correct? I think she's right. You think she's right, yeah. So she's saying we have M, we have C, and we have the XOR operation that we know. So M is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, correct? Cipher is 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, correct? Not missing anything? What is the result of XORing that? Let's see. Uh, so the XOR of this one is what? One, zero, one, one, yeah? What about these two? What are they? Karen? Um, the last ones are gonna be zero, zero, one. Zero, zero, one. Okay, so now the question, does this is supposed to be the key? Does it match our key? One zero one one zero zero one. Karen wins. Good job, Karen. Thank you. All right. So and then, uh, good job. All right. So let's see. Some people are in the chat. Okay. Good job. Okay. So Karen, uh, just do this. Uh, send me an email. You know, just say my name is Karen three fifty. You know, and just to remind me that that way I'll have your full name, and I can uh, bonus points on Blackboard, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, great, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so, uh, great. So we, we are done with that part. So now let's proceed. Um, so our XOR should be clear, hopefully, at this point. And that is, as I said, the simplest operation. Okay, so now we are ready to proceed. So we are, you know, again, we're, we're not talking about AES and DES yet. All we've defined of symmetric key encryptions is an operation called XOR. That's about all we know. And as, as I said, these are the primitives, right? From, the, from these primitives, we got to build ever more complex encryption algorithms. So let's, uh, so now let's proceed officially to 
something called the OTP. Somebody wrote something. Okay, so the OTP is an example of a secure cipher. So this is an example of a secure cipher. Okay, uh, and this is, you know, theoretically is what I was talking about is that some, someone set out to figure out, you know, do we really need to make algorithms like DAS AES or would this XOR operation, like the ones we've been looking at, just a, a sequence of bits, that's the message, a sequence of bits, that's the key, XOR, would that be enough? Now that is, the OTP stands for the one-time pad. And this has been around for a while. People have studied it, of course. Um, Okay, so the basic idea with this algorithm is, again, what, what we've been discussing, the cipher is the encryption, key and message, and that's just equal to K, XOR, M. Remember that's XOR. Okay, now the definition of a one-time pad is that it has a key. The message can be any, any sequence of bits. It doesn't matter, right? So remember, a message can be a movie, you know, a Netflix movie, could be a, a book, an encyclopedia, a set of encyclopedias, all of Wikipedia. You know, that's pretty big. So it doesn't really matter what it is. At the end of the day, all of that we know is stored as digital bits. So it's a sequence of bits. So that's defined. And then we, we know that the key is also a sequence of bits. But as it turns out, the, 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 the OTP has an additional definition. And that is that the key needs to be a random. So, so notice these words because they're, they're very heavy, very, very important. Um, it's a random sequence. So it's a random sequence of bits with an additional constraint that this random sequence of bits is as long as the message itself. What do you think about that? So now you have you know, imagine if you have a movie, a Netflix movie, and if we put that Netflix movie from beginning to end, it would be a very large sequence of bits. And now we're saying that the key, so we have a message, we have a key, and the key needs to be as long. So we have a message, length is equal to key length. You guys see that? Now we had said in symmetric key encryption, obviously we had said that you don't encrypt the whole thing. You, what you do, what? You break it into blocks, right? You break it into blocks and then the keys are smaller. They're su the size of the block, maybe 128 bits or, or 256 bits or, or something along those lines, 2046, whatever. Uh, but it's some uh, amount. But now the OTP is saying that one of the requirements is that the key has to be equal length as the message. So what, what, what do you say about that? What's your thought, your, your thinking? So that's a really large key, right? So that, you know, a very large key like that might be problematic. Imagine if you have to, every time you, you got to do something, you have to send a key that is as, as big as your movie. So it would like, 
this, this is probably really dumb, um, but like chop it, if you're going to chop the data into blocks, chop the key into blocks as well. That's what you, that's what we will do. For sure. That's actually what we're going to do is we're just going to chop the data into blocks and then just use one key of, of a small size. If you, if you took, so the, so I see what you said, you said, take the message, break it into blocks and the key, break it into blocks, but you still have the problem that whether you send the key as a whole or send the key in blocks, you still have to send all of them. You see that? So it's the equal is equal amount of information. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. So, so that's a problem. That's a problem. Now, the reason why you do, you want to, you, the OTP says that this is a good thing is because if you think about it, when we do a key of blocks, let's call this one K OTP and then K just something else. So, um, you know, K, okay, some other encryption algorithm. What's the problem with this? The problem is even though this might be fully random, right? The, you know, the original key might be fully random. As you start applying that same key to the whole message, what emerges? A pattern will emerge, right guys? Because this key is the same as that one, same as that one, same as that one, same as that one. You see that? You see the problem? So even though this one might have been originally random, as you start applying it to the whole message, there is a, a, a kind of a pattern emerging, emerging. Do you understand that concept, guys? Are there any questions on that? Yeah, no, I see what you mean. Yeah. And so the reason why... Um, so, so really, the OTP, th this idea of the key being the same size as the message is actually like, it's, it's the goal. That would be the goal. That would be what you would want because the whole pattern is random in theory, right? It's fully random. And so there would be no patterns along here. And so that might, that's, you know, would be better. Okay, so that's the intuition there. And uh, so the question that, then that you would ask yourself is, now that we understand this, um, so we can say, so is the OTP secure? Remember that idea, first, first of all, what do we know? First of all, we know we can't have, it's, it's impractical to have keys as big as the full message. That's the first assumption. So really, it's not practical to do. We can't, right? It's not possible. But if it were possible, you ask the question, is the OTP secure? Well, it's, it, it, it is fully random. And so that also takes us to another question, really. If we want to know if the OTP is secure, well, the first thing we need to know is, what is secure you see that that because we're saying oh is the otp secure well you might ask me but you know how do i know if something is secure you know what is secure or you know what makes a good cipher a good cipher what makes a good cipher you know those those are the key questions. Okay. And so cryptography has been studied uh, for quite a bit, right? It, it's been, it's been studied for a long time. And so this takes us historically, I'll give you a little bit of context here on the history of this. So, you know, because really uh, that takes us to a few set of events. The first one is uh, 1950s. Well, cryptography already existed. Um, so pre, let's say pre, pre um, World War II and during World War II. Right, uh, they were already looking at the Enigma 
the machine of the Germans. And also uh, we have um, in England, we have Turing. I think that's how you spell it. And he developed with his team a machine that would try to break this, but their encryption was um, not, as, not exactly as the encryptions we're talking about. But anyway, that's historically where encryption existed. Uh, so that's, you know, kind of pre all of this. And then in the 1950s, we have two events that are really important, both of them at Bell Labs, which if you don't know what Bell Labs is, is it was the AT&T um, research lab. Okay, and so then we had two things that are actually very important for computing, uh, which was the transistor. Okay, and then also um, information theory, which back then it was called communication theory. So information theory was developed by a gentleman named Claude Shannon. Okay, so he formulated a lot of things for the AT&T network related to communication. So first of all, he talked about, you know, the reliability of communication, you know, what was important to have reliable communication, but then he started studying, obviously, he studied other things like AI, he was interested in that, games. But one of the things that was really important that he did is cryptography. Unfortunately, a lot of the work that he did during that time is not so much well known because it's classified. So a lot of this was being done by, uh, for the military, what is now the NSA and the CIA, right? So the NSA in particular, you probably know that they do crypto uh, code breaking, things like that. Okay, but basically they hired Claude Shannon to kind of formulate all of these ideas. All of this was new. You know, he had formulated a theory of communication theory, information theory, and uh, then he was, uh, after that, he was consulting uh, on cryptography. And just the question was, really, you have to think about it, right? You, you kind of go back to the idea. You know, what algorithms do we need? But more importantly, because you can have thousands of people creating algorithms, let's just start with a very basic one, right? If we have a message, an XOR operation, and a key, is that secure? And that took us to what is secure? You know, what makes a good cipher? You see that? And so those, those are really the key things that Claude Shannon needed to establish somehow, okay? And you will see that he actually came up with, with something, um, a, a, a condition that is really interesting. Uh, might not be so intuitive at first when we see it, but you know, uh, that's a definition. So that's the idea, okay? So we're, we're trying to ask that question. Oh, this thing has, this has limits. So I can't create, any more slides, that's a problem. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, I can do this on PowerPoints. So give me a sec, I will create a slide. For whatever reason, I can't create any more slides. So let me, I'm gonna stop sharing this. Okay, and I'm going to create, are you, you guys are still there, correct? Yeah. Create a slide here. I should be able to write on that. Okay. Share this.
Okay, so you should be seeing the slides now. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think we're good. So I'll just write on here. Okay, so that, you know, that, that should be. Okay, so we were at historically then, you know, um, what makes a good cipher? What makes a good cipher? Okay. Um, and so the, the basic idea is, so, you know, now Shannon and the people doing this kind of research started thinking, okay, so, you know, how can I say, you know, if, if something is good or not, you know, how, how do I define a metric or some kind of a, 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 an approach that we can say that, yeah, this algorithm is good. So as it turns out, he came up with, in words, kind of this idea. So the basic idea is... Uh, the, so here we go. So remember, because remember what's going to happen is when you send a message and, and let's actually go back to Bob and Alice. Here. And they have, so they, there was an original message. There's a message over here. They have a key. And then let's imagine, you know, that's like the communication channel, something whatever, fiber optic, wireless, you know, radio waves, or, or cable, right? So copper or something like that. So whatever it is, it's communication channel. And this gets tapped by Zelda. And Zelda is an eavesdropper. So, you know, you have maybe firewall here, firewall over there. So Zelda cannot go in in that direction, right? And she cannot go in in that direction, but she has full access to this space here. And so really the only thing that will be sent across that channel is what? What is that called? Remember, this is called a cipher. What was the definition of the cipher? Or the cipher text? It's the encrypted message. It's the encrypted message, exactly. Very good. So now then, what we end up with is the basic idea is that, so, so remember, again, we are trying to define what makes a good cipher. That's, you know, the question we're trying to, you know, what, you know, why, you know, how do I know that what, what we use here is good, secure? What makes a secure, good, secure cipher? So you have to frame that in some way. So the basic idea is the cipher text, the cipher text should not reveal any information about the plain text. It sounds kind of trivially easy, right, to say that, but it's true. It's definitely true, right? The cipher text, which is C, should not reveal any information about the plain text. So if you have C, which Zelda could get, she should not be able to infer M from it. And so that's, first of all, that's the original or the basic idea, okay, that, that you want to have. So the question is, how do you measure that? Okay, how do you measure that? You know, is there some kind of a metric, some kind of a, of, of an approach? Okay. So Shannon and people like him who were working on that 
problem. You know, they, they did research, right? And they analyzed, so let's say, you know, uh, uh, Shannon, let's say, but I mean, you know, a lot of people, not just him, uh, uh, analyzed, analyzed the security of the OTP, where if you remember, it is the message and the key where message uh, or the length where the length of the message is equal to the length of the key. Okay, they're the same. Okay, so that's the idea of the OTP. And so they studied this question. And so the question is, you need to frame that, right? You need to frame that idea, right? And so, uh, and how do you quantify it? And it's very difficult to quantify actually um, to do this. You know, how, you know what, what would you do? Count the number of bits, you know, or, or what do you do exactly? And so really what, what Shannon did, he was uh, very good at, um, his, his area was like, what many of his areas, he had many areas, but he turned to probability. He turned to probability theory, right? And probability theory is the theory of the, you know, the likelihood of things, right? So it's a, it's, it's a metric. So I, you know, I, I don't know if you noticed, but you know, the key thing about it is that in probability theory, you know, now you end up with a metric. What is the probability of something? And we know that probabilities, you know, work in ranges from 0 0.0, .0 to 1.0, right? And anything in between. So that intuitively we all understand probabilities, you know, what's the likelihood that it's going to rain later tonight. Well, I don't know. I haven't looked at the weather, but the fact that it's been raining all afternoon probably means that it's going to rain. Now, some of you may have actually looked at the weather already and you know for a fact that it's not going to rain. So I made an observation based on what I've seen. Probabilistically, I think there's a likelihood that it's going to rain at least a little bit if it's not raining already, because if it is raining already, then I already met that probability, but I don't know. So do you guys see my point, guys? Yeah, definitely. And so that's what they were looking at, right? So if you remember the question that you're looking at before is what makes a good cipher. So, you know, how can I take cipher A and cipher B and say, this one gets two checks, this one gets only one. Which one is better? So you have to measure some kind of uh, metric. Okay, and so that's what Sh Claude Shannon was doing. And so he just came up with a very simple, simple thing. I, I mean, I've already stated it. I, you know, there's nothing more to say, except that he wrote, he wrote it like this. And this is probably what you'll, you'll see, um, you know, whenever you, you know, if you ever, if you ever look for this, you'll see something like this. So this is square brackets, yeah. So I got the this and this. Now I want you guys to understand that this is not like an algebra type of equation where I'm actually, because I could probably imagine some of you are already trying to um, solve for one of the variables or something like that. That's not what this is doing. Uh, it's more about what this is saying, okay? It's more about what this is saying. So let me just make sure I wrote this correctly. So that's uh, 
Now let me make this one more explicit that that's zero, this one is one. Okay, and that's, the ciphers are the same. So what do you think that is saying? And, and this, by the way, just means the probability. That just means the probability. So this is what, uh, you know, they came up with as far as how do you define if something is good? An algorithm should be good if it basically meets this condition. What do you think that that means? Anyone want to take a stab at, at it? So another way of saying this is, you know, you know, by definition, let's say a cipher E comma D um, has really good secrecy if the top condition is met. I should have written it backwards. So what do, you, what do you guys think? We have to interpret that a little bit um, to understand it. So we have E, we have K, we have M0 and M1, we have the ciphers, and we have PR, which stands for the probability. So what do you think is the, and, and as I said, don't try to solve it as an equation and solve for a variable. Instead, try to interpret what that is saying. So what do you guys think that's saying? Probabilities are going to be about the same. Uh, of what? Of what? You're on the right track. You're on the right track, but of what? Of the, um, of the cipher, like, result. So you have, so think about this. Zelda is able to get the cipher, right? We already saw that. I think it was in, oh, yeah. Zelda can get the cipher. And what do you think this is saying? So tell you what, let's do this because it's already, I'm seeing the clock. Uh, it, this is a good stopping point. I'm, gonna, I'm going to leave this as, um, you know, a problem for you guys to think about, okay? Think about this and then somebody on uh, Thursday just, Tell me what it means, okay? And maybe we'll do the same thing with bonus points. Whoever wants to go first, um, let me know. Is it, is it possible to give a stab at it really quick? You want to do it now? Go ahead, please. Uh, I, I'm just I'm just curious if this is right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so a cipher ED has a really good secrecy if the probability for the encryption of one message is equivalent to the probability of a different message. You are on the right track. It's yeah. just you, the way you said it. Uh, I think you you get the idea. You just there was a there's a slight better way of saying it. So if you have the the cipher right, that's what you have. Then a good cipher means what? that given the cipher, the probability of getting either M0 or M1 just by having the cipher is? The same, equivalent? The same, is the same, exactly. Very good. Do you understand now, guys? Yeah. So you're working backwards. And that's really what that's saying is that given this, the, the cipher, a good encryption algorithm is one where given that cipher, you have no chance of figuring out, oh, you know, it's not even about figuring it out, but it's just about, well, if I have the cipher, I have a slightly higher probability of figuring that it's M0 versus M1. There is none. 
they are the same. So that means, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, it's, impo it's, it's not, there's no pattern that points you in the direction of M0 versus M1. Do you see that, guys? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so very good. So we'll pick up where we left off here next time we meet. I think that this is a good stopping point. Um, and I will, um, you know, we'll just continue on Thursday. We will do the secret key lab, which is block cipher. So kind of what we talked about, we've been talking about all this time. All right. Okay, great. So let's stop here. Um, I'll stay a, a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, um, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Excuse me, Professor Kellogg. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Um, the, the question I wanted to ask you was, what's the, what, what chapter do we need to read in preparation for our lab? That's a good question, actually. For a secret key lab, you mean? Yes, this upcoming lab, because I know the labs correspond to our, uh, to our textbook. Yes, uh, you should read. I don't have the book in front of me now. Oh, no, I have it here. Chapter 21, Secret Key Encryption. Thank you very that's much. The, I appreciate it. That's the current lab that we are working on on Thursday. Awesome. Got Thank it. you. Yep. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, just as a side note, because uh, you were talking about Turing and all that before World uh, before World War and whatnot with uh, encryption. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever seen it or whatnot, but um, when I was taking a computer science course in high school, they showed a, a pretty good movie, I think, describing those events. Um, it's called The Imitation Game. And I've seen it uh, with yeah. uh, Cumberbath or something, an actor. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yes. Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, yeah yep, I thought yep. I thought that was an interesting movie about it. Yeah, they they that's they built the first computer, mechanical computer. It was uh, in the '40s before transistors, so I think they were using relays and vacuum tubes and all that. Yeah, it was but, some giant yeah. contraption. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I've seen that movie. It's pretty good. Yeah, I thought so too. I was just. Just wondering if uh, it just kind of put two and two together about that when you're bringing it up. Yeah, no, it's, you know, that's why I love to do the, the context and history because, you know, it just puts things into perspective of when things happen and why, right? What drove, you know, they had to do it because of the Second World War, so it became important. And then it just continued to evolve. And I don't think when they first started out, all of that, they, they thought that, you know, your online shopping and your Netflix and your email was going to depend on all of that. <laughs> yeah, was. basically everything at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they couldn't see into the future. So, you know. Definitely not, because I think it started off like with Turing, uh, with like a notebook between a friend of his, like they created like a secret way of uh, communicating to each other that nobody else could. And then it- Yeah, I think it, he like, just like, you know, because ciphers are like puzzles, right? If you think about it, You'll, we'll see that in one of our labs uh, when we do the, uh, a substitution cipher. It's just like a little fun, you know, cracking the code kind of thing. And so I think that's how it, people have interest in, in it like that. And then it evolved. It has evolved into very interest, very, very important things in our society. Yeah, that's, yeah, for, for sure. Definitely a bit, everything. <laughs> so even yeah. what we're doing now and whatnot. So. Yeah. Very interesting, though. Um, excited to try it out. So you said you're going to post what the lab is on Thursday? The lab is already posted on oh, okay. uh, Brightspace. It's already there. With the list of, uh, of tasks and whatnot from the document? Yes. Uh, it, I usually just put the final list of tasks on the Dropbox. So I, I have to create a Dropbox for it. And then usually there I just write do, you know, 1A, 2B, you know, but gotcha. there, there's a PDF and then we're not going to do every problem. We're just going to do a, a, a set of problems. Okay. Gotcha. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, uh, enjoy the rest of your night and see you Thursday. Yeah, you too. See you Thursday. Thanks. Thanks.